Hello. Many people today think that the church is in a pretty bad way. This is particularly true of the church in this country and in the West in general. From the outside, it meets with criticism from those who no longer believe in God and indifference from almost everyone else. And inside the church, its members are often horribly confused about the church's real purpose. People describe the church as irrelevant, complacent, out of touch, smug and self-satisfied, or pompous, old-fashioned and conservative. It's ironic that the church of today looks like this because the person who started it all, Jesus Christ, was anything but out of touch or pompous. Rather, he was a down-to-earth person who attracted a large amount of attention, not just from his followers, but from his enemies too. <coughs> the uh, first lesson is taken from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. And as Jesus passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees... Just a minute! Saw... I beg your pardon. Now let's stop right there and think about what's been said. Sometimes we're so used to hearing the Bible being read in a respectable setting that we forget the shocking nature of some of the things that Jesus said and did. The church has been very good at ignoring the controversial aspect of Jesus and clothing him instead with respectability. Take the passage we just heard, for example. Jesus was mixing here with the most despised elements of Jewish society. To eat with a publican, that is, with a tax collector, would ruin the reputation of any Jew. Tax collectors were seen as enemies of Israel because they worked for Rome. The Orthodox Jews said they were unclean because of their contact with Gentiles, and the common people hated them for their dishonest demands. The passage also says that he was eating with sinners. That was a despising term the Pharisees used to describe those who were virtually criminals. At various times, Jesus associated with thieves, political agitators, and prostitutes. No wonder the Pharisees were so offended by his behavior. How would we react if we heard that a popular Christian leader had been seen eating and drinking with prostitutes and terrorists? Jesus refused to be tied down by anyone's expectations of how he ought to behave. Instead, he insisted on helping those who had real need of him. When he heard the Pharisees complaining about the company he kept, he replied, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. One of the things that comes across from the gospel record is just how incredibly fit Jesus must have been. You can tell that by the casual way in which the writers throw in journeys like going from Judea to Galilee via Samaria, a round trip of perhaps 80 miles, just Jesus walking that distance. Even a man as fit as that could get tired on a journey like that. And it's no wonder that when he got to Samaria, in the heat of the midday sun, Jesus came to the well and sat down. He was tired. The disciples went off to get some food. Now, it was no accident that Jesus was there in Samaria. Most Orthodox Jews at the time of Jesus hated Samaritans. They were racially inferior, they thought, and their religion was a hodgepodge of messed up ideas. They would avoid the Samaritans like the plague. They would go right round Samaria in order not to come into contact with them. But Jesus was there on purpose. His father had made it clear there was somebody there to meet. So he was looking out for the unusual and he saw it. A woman with a bucket coming to the well. That wasn't the sight that was unusual. The timing was. The morning, yes. The evening, but you didn't come midday unless you were trying to avoid people. Now, the tensions crackled in the air between them as she began to draw water out the well. He was a rabbi, a Jew, a man. She was a woman of Samaria. And, well, the racial, religious, and even the tension between the sexes was just there in the silence. Give me a drink. You! 
you? A Jew? Asking a drink of me, a Samaritan, and a woman at that? Huh. If you knew who was talking to you, he said, you'd ask him for a drink. And he'd give you living water, running water. She looked at him. No, she said, you got no bucket with you. Where would you get running water from? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well? Now, nice little bit of religious controversy thrown in there. Anybody who drinks of this water, he said, will thirst again. The water that I will give would be inside him, welling up to eternal life. Now, she's not stupid. He's a rabbi. She knows he's talking about spiritual things. God, but she's going to play the game. Oh, she said, give me some of this wonderful running water. Then I said, I'll never have to come to this rotten well again, will I? And draw water out of it. Let's go back to reality. Go and call your husband, he said. Hmm. I haven't got a husband. You're quite right. You're telling the truth there. You've had five, and the one you've got at the moment, he's not yours. Ouch. What do you do with a prophet? I can see you're a prophet, she said. A bit of religious controversy. That's the way to get rid of them. Why are the Protestants and Catholics fighting in Northern Ireland? Why, why don't Jews and Samaritans get on? Who's right? Who can tell the difference? I mean, surely it's all relative. Hmm. No, said the Lord Jesus, it's not all relative. It just so happens the Jews are right, but it doesn't matter. You see, God's looking for people like you. Looking at him wistfully, she said, I know that when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us the truth. Jesus could have said, this is your lucky day. What he said was, you're looking at him. Jesus' disciples were obviously shocked and horrified to find Jesus talking to a woman. They must have had a terribly low opinion of women in those days. Yes, I think they did. They had tremendous prejudice against women and the same kind of attitude, of course, exists in many other places in the world today. The Jewish teachers then uh, discouraged men from talking to women in public. Indeed, there was a common saying that let no one talk with a woman in a street, no, not even with his own wife. And so you can see it was very unusual for Jesus to be seen talking with a woman. Would you say then that that was typical of his attitude towards women or not? Yes, certainly. The Jews who ignored the women uh, were quite different from Jesus, who taught the kingdom of God to everybody, including women, and it's quite clear that he had a tremendous respect and regard for women. They were of enormous worth and significance, just as much as men, of course. And they responded to this uh, care and compassion and love towards them, and indeed their commitment and discipleship put many of the other disciples to shame. So why was the woman at the well so shocked that Jesus would talk to a Samaritan like her? Well, basically, the Jews hated the Samaritans. They had no dealings with the Samaritans at all, for various reasons. Partly, the Samaritans were not pure Jews. They, were, they had intermarried. They had mixed blood, and therefore the Jews saw this as a betrayal. Also, the Samaritans wouldn't worship in the temple in Jerusalem, which is the only place the Jews said you could worship. Mm. And political history also was against them, because 200 years before, the Samaritans helped the Syrians to fight against the Jews, and so there were all those obstacles in the way. Now, Jesus cut through all those prejudices, racial, religious, and political. Do you think he did that purely because he just liked to be unconventional for the sake of it? Well, he said he was unconventional, and sometimes he, he did shock. But if he shocked, then it was always to try and make the truth of his teaching clear, to make people think about what he was really saying. And if he was unconventional, it was usually because some convention or prejudice stood in the way of reaching out to people and their real needs. And so Jesus wasn't different just for the sake of being different. He was only different if, in compassion, he had to break through some of the rules and regulations to touch people at that point of, of greatest need. Mm. Do you think the church today is limited in its compassion and in its following of Jesus? I'm afraid so. I think the church has failed a great deal in this and is still failing at the moment, of course, because we tend to take so many of the attitudes of the world and use them as the norm for the church, the body of Christ, and it shouldn't be like that. So we find, sadly, within the church today, many racial prejudices, mm -hmm. or financial, or social, and all these are wrong. 
we should be able to see that these are so against the teaching of Christ that deeply we repent of them and then be free in ourselves to challenge the status quo and not just to accept it because God wants us to be an alternative society to show something different to the world around us. It's early evening in winter and here in Leeds in the north of England the homeless know that if all else fails the church will provide food, clothing and shelter. For 12 years, the warden of St. George's Crypt has been Don Patterson. Well, the work here is, is largely for those who are homeless. It's for anyone in need, but we get large numbers of homeless men coming to us. They come into our doors needing shelter, needing food, needing fresh clothing, uh, and above all, needing to be cared and wanted and to find that there's somewhere where they can belong and be wanted. Some are very intelligent, but on the whole, they're the least adequate of men. They're the first to fall unemployed, the first to be off from their home looking for work. The least adequate of men leaving homes, perhaps broken homes, and trying to make their way in life. Least able to cope, least able to get the benefits that the state wants them to have even, but they can't slot into that. And so they've become homeless, one of the most horrible states to be in, as our psychiatrist was saying recently. One of the hardest things to hit a man is to become homeless. It's worse than losing a limb, perhaps. Each one who comes in here is infinite in, in God's sight. The Lord died for each one who comes in here, and their value is infinite. Is it rubbing on your And he longs that they be cared for. Mm. Well, there you are. It's been worth it, doesn't it? I'd bless you if he did give me one. Oh, that's not been worth it, really. Oh. Over the last 10, 15 years, we've had a medical team. We've always had nurses, but now we have nurses and doctors, and they all come freely and voluntarily. And they form almost a mini hospital of being able to refer from one speciality to another okay. and to care and to get to grips with the problems that men face. How do you feel yourself? Oh, I'm fine, no, it's just that... Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, you feel perfectly fit? Yes. Just came on, let's strip off and have a good look, shall we? Yes. It's been itching a lot, hasn't it? Yes. Yes. Does it go lower down as well? Yes. Have you got anything there to crash? No, can we just have a look? Oh, have you a bottle? No, because I can't keep that for you. No. Put your bottles in your own room. I'll put it in my mind, but I would like a small bottle. And it can be cleared up, but they need to find out what infection is, and they need to take a little off and uh, find out what the, what the bug is that's causing it. Do you follow me? Yeah. Then you, you look a tiny bit up. Why well, do sit down? Are you worried about going? Well, I was, yeah. <coughs> Don't you want to go? Well, I will go. It's for my own benefit. Um, well, I'm, I'm there tomorrow morning. What about if you come and see me and I'll take you to them so that you know where to go? Because yes. I work at the infirmary. I don't do skins. I'm in the x-ray department. Okay. What time could you come up and see me tomorrow and I'll take you to the skin department myself? What time will they be? Your... Well, can you manage to get there, say, at half past eight? Yes. Or nine o'clock? You sure? Okay. Well, rather than write a letter, I'll take you myself to the uh, skin clinic and we'll get the specialist to give you something. Okay. I see the men here. I just see like the folks who are coming to Jesus. And the things he's asking us to do are the things that he was doing. Not with the same power or authority. But we are reaching out and touching. And men are finding peace and healing in our day just as he reached out and touched and they found peace and healing. I think 
ago was it that uh, Ernest died? Was it about a year ago? Twelve months. Twelve months since Ernest died. Yeah, yeah. We miss him. We miss him because he was always here, wasn't he? Yeah, your best mate. Uh, we see people who come from all over the country, but if only their need could have been met before they left home in the churches and the parishes and the areas where they, they set out from. We know that they come from all over this country and their needs are there, they need to be wanted, to be accepted, to be helped there, to fit in. And somehow they've slipped through. It's not just that men and women slip through the safety net of the welfare state, but they're slipping through the safety net of the love of God that the church should be providing for them. Sometimes it seems as if the church almost needs to be struck dumb in order to express the love of God for folks who cannot fit in. Jesus, after all, reached out and touched the leper, and only after he'd reached out and touched him did he speak and said, I will be clean. And that leper was accepted and wanted and at home with the Saviour who had reached out and touched him. The church needs to reach out and touch, not just to speak from afar to folks who are in need. Because of his unconventional behavior, Jesus attracted two kinds of attention. Those who wanted to follow him and those who watched him closely and plotted his downfall. People are not able to make up their minds about who he was, but everyone was talking about him. Right in the middle of his ministry, Jesus finally asked his disciples an important question, which we now ask in the middle of the series. Who is Jesus? One day, when Jesus was praying alone, the disciples came to him. Who do the crowd say that I am, he asked them. Some say that you are John the Baptist, they answered. Others say that you are Elijah, while others say that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. What about you, he asked them. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are God's Messiah. Then Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell this to anyone. Who is Jesus? Was he simply one of the many teachers who were around in his own time who happened to become famous? Was he a remarkable healer and wonder worker, but nothing more? Jesus said many things about himself that help us to answer these questions. When we compare what he said with the way in which the great religious leaders describe themselves, there's a remarkable contrast. One of the leaders of a world religion, Buddha, directed attention away from himself so that his disciples would not be distracted in their search for release from earthly sensations and pleasures. He did not see himself or any other person as essential to the nature of the search. Similarly, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, pointed away from himself. Very little is said about him in the Quran. He insisted that he was only a man without any supernatural powers beyond receiving the Quran from the hands of Allah. Even today, Orthodox Islam regards any form of worship addressed to Muhammad as worse than heresy. What was it that Jesus was saying of himself that made him different from these religious figures? Well, Jesus clearly said and did many things which showed him to be different from mere man. For example, what would your reaction be if I said to you, do you want to know what God is like? Well, look at me, because if you've seen me, you've seen God. I and God are one. Do you want to find God? Well, come to me, because I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will never die for all eternity. I have the right to forgive you all your sins. One day I'm going to come back to this world to judge all people of all time. And what happens to you for all eternity depends upon your response to me and my words. And if while I'm saying things like this, someone comes up and kneels down here and looks up to me in an attitude of worship and adoration and says to me, my Lord and my God, what would you think if I accepted his worship and gently rebuked him for being slow to believe? You can see from the things that Jesus said, he's very, very different from other religious teachers. 
So who was Jesus saying he was? Well, basically, he said that he was equal with God. On one occasion, when he was talking, he was suddenly stopped by his critics and said, are you saying that you're greater than, than Abraham? And Jesus replied, before Abraham was, I am. Now, there wasn't only claiming that he existed before Abraham, though that's staggering in itself, but he was actually taking the divine name for God by which God had revealed himself to his, to his people, the I am, the eternal, the existent one, and was claiming that for himself. And quite clearly the Jews, the critics, understood what he was getting at, because at once he, they picked up stones to stone him to death, because it was absolute blasphemy, if not true. And therefore he is unique amongst the various religious leaders in the world. I think if these things are true, you can see that Christianity is not so much like the other religions, man in search of God, but it's the other way around, God in search of man. Mm. But you know, someone once said that they were rather fed up with the beauty contest approach to world religions, that people tend to look at religions and then choose whichever one suits them best. Isn't that what you're doing now? Well, I can understand that kind of frustration, but I think really we've got to look at the evidence and then wear it up for ourselves and then make our own mind up about Jesus. Because when you listen to the kind of things that Jesus said, frankly, they're absolutely monstrous, if not true. And yet everything about the gospel records paints him as someone who's perfectly sane and perfectly rational. Now, there may have been others who have claimed to be equal with God, but you look at Jesus, you see that he was filled with compassion, he healed those who were sick, he spent time with people who were uh, the rejects of society, he died for our sake, and he, raised, he was raised again from the dead. Everything about him, everything about his life and his teachings and his work says, yes, his claims are true. He really is what he claimed to be the Son of God. Nishi Sharma was born a Hindu. When Christian friends interested him in the person of Jesus, he found him to be very different from the many thousands of Hindu gods. He spoke to Tim Dean about this. I think one difference which I noticed was that he died for our sins. There were many other gods who incarnated. They showed the way which way to go, but they, nobody died for the sin of man. That was one thing which I noticed was different about Jesus. I also found that Jesus was sinless. There's one very popular Hindu god who, Krishna for example, his life cannot be called sinless. People say that your religious beliefs have nothing to do with your conduct. Consequently, there I found Jesus was a different sort of man. Thirdly, I found that Jesus is alive today. He died on the cross and then he rose again. And uh, he is not a, just a social reformer, he's a transformer. He transforms people. Whereas I found that Hindu gods often showed you the way, but nobody actually goes with you through the pilgrimage. Whereas Jesus comes with me on the pilgrimage, he's walking with me. I think that's the basic difference, I would say, between Hindu gods and uh, Jesus. When you open the Gospels and read about the life of Jesus, what impresses you most about him? I think his humility was something that stood out to me. Humility is not part of our society. We are very proud people. And uh, when I read about Jesus, that he, when he was taken to Jerusalem for trial, he, Roman soldiers spat upon his face and he accepted that, he didn't defend himself. That was something remarkable. I just couldn't believe it, first of all, when I read it, because I thought that he himself was God, and yet he took that sort of abuse and didn't retaliate. The four Gospels were not written merely as a record of what Jesus did. They were written to make the reader ask who Jesus was and what our response to him should be. John underlines his picture of the character of Jesus with a series of Jesus' sayings, which all start with the words, I am. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as a father knows me, and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When we consider the historical records of the life of Jesus and the testimony of his first followers to his life and teaching, it seems that we can fairly say that no one had ever lived as Jesus lived, taught as Jesus taught, and claimed what Jesus claimed. Putting all this together, we cannot simply pay Jesus the compliment of being a good human teacher, because if he was only that, then what he said about himself was a lie. So we're left with three choices in answering the question, who is Jesus? Either he was a deluded madman with strange, exalted ideas about himself, or he was a confidence trickster who fooled people into believing his outrageous claims, or he was who he said he was, God. When we seriously consider the life of Jesus, we must opt for one of those choices. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The Gospel accounts give us a picture of Jesus as a man unusual in his own time, challenging the conventions that got in between him and those that he came to help, but clearly his unusual qualities extend beyond that. It's easier for us to admire his bold overturning of conventions than it is seriously to look at the amazing things he said about himself, because when we consider who he said he was, we can't simply admire him from a distance. He forces us to choose whether we'll accept him as God and follow him or ignore who he really is. And this is what happened in Jesus' own time. He polarized those around him into his supporters and his enemies. And in the next program, David and I will be looking at the opponents of Jesus and asking what it was that made people turn against him. Mm -hmm.